<laughs> we just worship a little bit more and we go home. That'd be great, right? Um, we'll worship through this. And uh, I'm gonna kind of preface this, okay? We're gonna dive into a couple topics that are really gonna be some sensitivity to this. And uh, as with everything in this series, if you've been here for a long time, you're like, well, okay, that's just in the flow here. But listen, like, we're not, we're not trying to be intentionally provocative in any form or fashion. Honestly, our heartbeat here and what we've been digging into for the last several months is just, let's get a, let's get a clear, unfiltered, um, the best we possibly can, unaltered perspective of what a perfect world that God created looked like. Because we are so, um, we're so devastated by sin and its impact. It, it impacts our very nature individually, so it, it flows out from our own sin nature, and even our perspective is jaded. Our, like, it, it's, it's impossible to get back to perfection on our own in any form or fashion. So we, we try our relationships are all altered. The, the very world we live in is completely altered, completely different than what an original perfect plan was. And so we're so used to this world because it's all we've ever known that literally like we have to work hard to get back to how God planned it. And there's, there's only a couple of chapters <laughs> of that plan, and it's Genesis 1 and chapter 1 and 2. And, and then, you know, we go to the very end of the scriptures, and the last two chapters have kind of a perfect world, but it's a whole other world that when you even read it, you're kind of like, wow, like, that's different. I can't even grasp a lot of it. <clears throat> and some of the reason you can't grasp the very end is because you, you can't get a taste of the very beginning. And we're in this altered world that we don't, we, we weren't made for. And that's kind of where we ended last week is that like we were created for a perfect world. So number one, like give yourselves a little break when, when the imperfections and the sin nature pushes in on you because of your own sin, impacts you because of other sin, or just your tiredness and your weariness with the world that we live in, okay? It should weary us because we weren't built for this. We weren't made for this. We're living in an altered world that's not our home. And so it should feel a little bit like not home. So let's dive in and remember our goal here is just to figure out the best we can what was original. Because I think it, God has a, a ton for us. We're kind of shifting here into the next several weeks that we're just gonna be talking about the original plan, what, what, what caused God to institute an idea called marriage, all right? And that's, that's where we're at in this story. So let's dive in, Genesis chapter two, verses, um, I think we're gonna cover three verses today. Light speed, right? <clears throat> um, the Lord God placed, and of course, two of them were ones he covered last week, and I wasn't quite finished with it, so we're really only making one progress. All right, here we go. The Lord placed the man in the Garden of Eden to tend it, watch over it, but the Lord God warned him you may freely eat of the fruit of every tree in the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit, you're sure to die. I'm not gonna dive back into all that we covered last week, but jump in online and, and listen to it. But here, here's where we're picking up. God in his perfect world, in his infinitely perfect world, in his infinitely perfect wisdom, gave Adam a choice, okay? There's all kinds of things, theological things written about choice. And most of them go to the thing like, hey, you, 
your choice, you don't really have a choice, or God doesn't give you a choice, or whatever, because your, your, your sin nature is, like, you're, you're so altered, you're so devastated by sin, that you think you have a choice, but you don't have a choice, okay? There's a line of thinking that goes that way, and uh, it's just, again, we're just diving back to perfect Adam, sinless Adam, perfect relationship with God, Perfect unity in the garden, no division. And, and God in his sovereignty, in his providence, and in his plan, he put a tree there and, and made it, he created it. And he gave Adam the freedom of all of this, but not this. Why did he do it? I don't, I don't know. But again, the Bible indicates that that was also the reality in the heavenly realm before this, that Lucifer, who was the most beautiful angel, at some form or fashion, God in that realm, perfect realm, there was the opportunity for the angelic beings to have a choice, to continue to step into what they were created for and worship God or in pride, say, I'm gonna do my own thing. And so it's consistent about how God does this. Why? He doesn't give us that. It's a great question, okay? When we see him face to face. And so in his perfect world, he created a choice. Throughout the scriptures, even when the brokenness of those choices take full impact, it still seems like, you know, I set before you, it sits before the nation of Israel, hey, life and death. I said it before you. Oh, that you would choose life that you may live. All through the Old Testament, all through the New Testament, there's this this step of choosing to trust a God who created you. And you're responsible for this truth that God communicates to you, okay? So God communicates a, I'm gonna say it's a moral truth hey, don't do this, do, like, eat of all this, but don't do this. God communicates to Adam a moral choice, and he makes him responsible for it. And listen, Adam's responsibility over that, the choices that he makes in that realm are not just gonna impact him. The choices that he makes in this moral choice that God gives him are going to extend to everything that God put him in charge of. So what did God put him in charge of? Pretty much everything he just made, right? Like rule over this, subdue it. You are my representative. You're the only one created in my image of all creation. You bear, you're, you're literally my image bearer on this earth so that everything else that was created, when they look at you, they're like, oh, that looks like God. And so <clears throat> he gave Adam a moral choice and Adam's choice in that doesn't just impact himself. It extends to everything that he's in charge of. So it's a big deal. Here's the other big deal. At this point in the story, Eve is not created, okay? Eve doesn't exist. So I wanna just talk to men today for a second, all right? Ladies, I promise we're getting to you. I promise you it is going to be very challenging when we get there. But we all have to grasp the reality of what perfect world looks like. He created Adam and he gave him this command. Now, we're gonna get in a couple weeks or a couple months to Genesis three and we're gonna talk about temptation, okay? And when we get to that story, we're gonna see Eve give in to temptation. And I'm like, right here is where that starts. Because right here, Eve didn't have the word from God. Eve wasn't told directly that we know of. It's just not recorded. God may have done that, but I'm assuming that he didn't. 
I'm assuming that he gave this word, this instruction, this moral choice to Adam, and his understanding is, Adam, you're, what you do with this truth matters. So handle it wisely. You're responsible. And his responsibility extended to sharing that truth with Eve, in which I think that the scriptures indicate that he, he failed to do completely. Because when Eve starts to try to respond to the serpent, she misquotes God. And she misrepresents what his original command was. And I don't, know, I don't think it was necessarily her. My assumption is that it's Adam's fault. Because God gave his word, his instruction to Adam before Eve was even created. He says, you're responsible for this. So here's like uh, six things, all right, that I think kind of flow out of this as men in this world, all right? All out of this one little instance. Number one is all of us as men have to accept the freedom of, of making moral choices. Like, it's, it's kind of the nature in most men to want to be able to make their own choices, all right? Nobody wants to be handicapped in their choices. Nobody wants to be limited. That's part of who we are as men is we want to remove, like, the barriers and have that freedom. But the reality is, at, like, you have to accept the freedom of making those moral choices because what choices you make in your world in your marriage, in your family, in your community, it matters. It matters. And that's on you. Like you have to, you have to have the moral oomph to call right, right, to call wrong, wrong. And when the topics come up, you don't get to go like, yeah, well, I can see this, and it's just this man, be like, like the voice that cuts through that says, that's wrong. Like, not defensive, not aggressive, but hey, that's not right. It's a powerful voice. It's a powerful voice. Your moral choices matter, and you have to have, like, the boldness to own that, and in our world, we don't have that. So everything is up for grabs. Second thing, you have to be responsive to and responsible for the truth that God gives you. What God has revealed to you, you're, you're responsible for. So the first thing is I gotta be responsive to it. So here's, here's the word, and what I mean by responsive to it is kind of moves us into these next two topics. The first thing is line yourself up under. Be submissive to God's word. That's our response to his word. The word submission means to line yourself up under. And so our first thing is when God speaks, when his word comes to us, he gives us the freedom, and then he says, hey, line yourself up under it. We don't stand above the word. Criticizing, critiquing, deciding what goes and what's, what's good and what's bad. No, no, our first instance, our first reaction is yes, Lord. That's, that's what's responsive. And then we gotta be responsible for the truth. The, the, the fourth thing, as men, demonstrate your trust in God's word through action, okay? It's faith in action. It's lining ourselves up under this word, being responsive to it, but then we be, we're responsible for the content of that. And the content of God's word is always gonna lead us to a crisis of belief, a crisis in our own hearts that says, do I trust this or do I not? Do I believe this or do I not? But that belief when we say yes is not enough. It has to move us to a belief that, that takes its incarnation, that takes its flesh decision out in action. We move, we act. 
There's a lot of men that want to stop short, just lining ourselves up under God's word. And you're, you're like good guys, okay? But you, don't, but you don't move to the next step of action because that action requires you putting your, your, your character, your reputation on the line. Action invites criticism always. Bold action will face not just criticism, but opposition and attack. Bold, godly action might get you killed. But that's, if, if that happens, you stand in an amazing line of followers of Jesus Christ who did the exact same thing. Demonstrate your trust in God's word through action. Listen, we got a lot of good men that believe the right stuff and you don't take any action on it. And this world needs you to act, okay? We, we have to formulate a reality of, of God's mission on men that we are not passive, we don't sit back We act first, we move first, we take initiative, and that's what we do because we're men, and that's how God made us. That's what he made Adam to do. And Adam's failure, his passivity, led to the condition that we all have to endure right now. It's that big a deal. Fifth thing. Your moral choices impact everything under your care. Your sphere of responsibility. So every man in this room, you gotta understand, you got a sphere of responsibility according to God, whether you wanna accept it or not, whether you wanna live under it or not, it doesn't matter what you choose about it, it doesn't matter what you decide about it, it is your sphere of responsibility and influence and the decisions you make will impact everything under that sphere. So if you're not married, your sphere of influence is the family you're in, you grew up in, you've got responsibilities to honor your father and mother. How do you do that? Some of the most amazing stories I've been a part of watching is um, some people, uh, not unlike many of you in this room, where Father's Day is, is a little difficult. It's a little challenging because you didn't have a great example of a father, and so this is a little pain, more painful day because it's a reminder of, of maybe like what wasn't there. And walking with people who've had that experience on the journey of, listen, what does it look like to honor a father who wasn't a good father? That's a deep, tough journey. It's a tough road. But it's the sphere of influence of us as people because that's our responsibility. When you step into marriage, and and hopefully today and these next few weeks will give you a great picture of what you're stepping into because like part of what I'm trying to do in premarital counseling is like, hey, I know it seems good and everything's like spectacular and let's just get on with this and this is going to be amazing. Like, you just wanna like slow them down, wait. Do you understand what you're getting into? You are dramatically expanding your sphere of influence as a man. Because you're responsible. You're responsible for, for that wife that you're extending influence over, care. When you step into that, there's a whole new set of commands that comes with the example of Jesus Christ if that's not high enough for you. That says this is what Jesus is to his bride. He's working to like purify her so that so we can present her at this day of the wedding feast, pure, blameless. Like it's a stewardship responsibility and you're, you're, you're stepping into that. Your moral choices affect that. If the Lord chooses to bless you with kids and reward you, according to his word, with kids, 
your sphere of influence grows. And you're responsible for them. I don't think that responsibility necessarily ends. When you choose to take up residence in any place, your sphere of influence is there. When you choose to step into a job, your sphere of influence is there. If you like sports and are part of, you know, any kind of fan club or whatever, if you're a hobbyist and half of you are, like, you're responsible for that sphere of influence. You can't escape it. And it's not part of the fall. It's part of God's original world. That's how he made it. And your choices, your moral choices in each of those areas will, will matter. When you make poor moral choices, the lie of the enemy is nobody knows and this is not only gonna affect, this is only gonna affect me because nobody knows. And, and, and you have bought into the lie of Satan at that moment. Every one of your tiniest moral choices should feel like, because that's how God made you. Last thing, your responsibility extends to preparing and leading others to make good moral choices with the freedom they have. We can't just figure out how to live in this moral freedom of choice. We have to lead others to navigate that. And we see the failure of that in Adam with, with Eve. Because he failed to help her navigate her own freedom of choice. So listen, what, what, what does this matter? Okay, ladies, I'm grateful for you guys, girls and giving your summer to, to camp in the city. Right here, the guys, they're here. Like you, you, you matter okay, because you have the responsibility to help others in your sphere navigate that freedom of influence. Like, we've got to quit giving up in that realm. You know, 86% of school teachers or some stat like that are females. I mean, I understand why. Usually the pay is not something that you're gonna, you know, necessarily like lead a whole family from. And so there's a lot of influence, a lot of reasons why, but listen, any males that are school teachers, and like they need to be our heroes, okay? Listen, females, you matter. Like I'm just not, this is not moving this. This is where I'm getting into this tension. All right, just deal with it. I'll quit explaining it. The message will be shorter and here we go. Just trust me on this. Like, but like, you know, I, Jason Hutchins, man, he's a, he's a, uh, seventh grade uh, PE teacher, sixth through eighth grade. Coaches football at the middle school. I mean, he's been at Jay and Freeze, and then he helped open CC Griffin, and now he's at Hickory Ridge. He helped open that. Like, and I'm like, that guy's influence. Just steady, steady, consistent. And that's who that's who he is. Like, and he he's one of my heroes because. And the, and any parent, some of you have had this conversation. You'll come and you're like, hey, I, my kid, like seventh grade or sixth grade, and you know, things are going to listen, listen. This is what you need to know. If you're at Hickory Ridge, you tell your kid, if anything at that school is, does not make you comfortable or anything is out of whack, go immediately to Jason Hutchins. You go immediately to Jason Hutchins. You bypass everything and you get to him, and he'll take care of you. I've said that. 50 times over the last 12 years. Because that's, that's, that's his influence. And I know he'll take care of him. We've had this conversation. I've told my own kids the exact same thing. Like, we have to, like in churches, who's working back here in our children's areas right now? I don't know the makeup. I can guess. I mean, you want to take a guess? It's probably close to the same as school teachers. Probably 86% female. It's our responsibility. We have, we have to, not, that, not that you can't do a good job, not that women can't do as adequate, but like this is it. Like your responsibility, Adam's responsibility extends to that. 
And you have to own that. All right, let's keep moving. This is what's true about Adam before Eve enters the picture. You need to know that. All of this stuff, this is who God is. There's not, well, Eve, and this is her responsibility. Eve's not here yet. This is what's true about being a man before anyone knew what a husband was like. So these things don't, like some of you guys who aren't married, you think when I get married, that's when I'll take my responsibility seriously. Adam's not married here. There is no female here. This is all still his responsibility. And one of the errors in our culture is that we've created this like teenage and it's now extended to 20 something and you know, in 10 years, it'll be in the early 30s where like it's just this place where we don't push men to grow up quickly. We, we allow grown men to be nine-year-olds and, and, and we, we just applaud it. We celebrate it. We make videos and TV shows out of it. It's what's true about you before you, you, anyone even knew what a husband was. It, this is also what's true about being a godly man before being a dad. Here's, here's the reality. When you read through the scriptures, what keeps coming up over and over again that the church has ignored for years is the evil perpetrated on a society because of fatherlessness. When you work in a realm of fatherlessness, evil runs rampant. It runs rampant over poor and innocent unborn babies. It's something that the stats are staggering. Like 90% of women who have aborted their children say, I would have not gone through with this if the dad was in the picture and wanted this. If, if that unborn child just has a dad that does this, he or she lives. Fatherlessness it's the beginning part of the breakdown, and it's why evil targets fathers. Because if he can neutralize you, if he can get you focused on your own like sinfulness and your own weakness and every reason that you shouldn't stand up, that every reason you shouldn't be bold, like he can run rampant through a society. Because if we move, remove. Male fathers from families, then, then we have complete collapse. Just read the stats in, in America today on African American households. If you, if you know an African American dad who loves his wife, and is in with his kids, like you, you applaud them, they have fought to be exactly where they're at. Because something like 70 or 80% are not doing that. So when I see like that, that effort, that try, I mean, one of the reasons I try to coach football as much as I can is because you get in touch with families and you see structures and you're like, oh, like, man, and you see dads, like, ooh, they're trying, let's go. There. And you just like wrap around them and say, hey, whatever we can do, I'm in, I'm in. But this is what evil does, and it's not just about African American. Like, listen, like, like, Every other population is heading that way. Fatherlessness is a pathway to lawlessness. And lawlessness, when you read the end of this story, 
come straight from the pit of hell. In fact, the leader of the pit of hell is called the man of lawlessness. And the reason I'm starting to use that language is very intentional because we are living right here, right now, in a nation that's bordering on lawlessness with no responsibility, no repercussion. That's what lawlessness is. And if you don't believe me, just, you live in the suburbs. Why? Enough said, right? The lawlessness that's breaking out is is pervasive. And some, God has to say, hey, like, who's gonna, who's gonna be my representatives? Who's gonna stand? Um, when I look at that list, I created that list, and a lot of what I created was uh, just a reflection of the dad I had. And a lot of you know this, 270 days ago, my dad passed away, and... Um, He knew, he accepted the freedom of making moral choices. He knew that. He's a military guy, too. He knew what what difference it made. He was responsive. He was responsible for the truth that God gave him. Like, I I knew that. You just understood that with Dad. You you knew that he he wasn't perfect, but he, he sought to line himself up under God's word rather than stand on top of it as its judge. He... He demonstrated trust through action. He's a lot more measured than I am, but then I look at some of the things he did and I thought, that's more risky than me. I've never picked up just a random hitchhiker. I've never done that. My dad did that. Like I, you know, and so you just hear, because this is what he, he told me, the whole reason for it, I won't go into it, but like, he knew his moral choices, they impacted everything. He understood his sphere of influence, work, home, business, community, everything. It's, it's just, who, it's, it's, it's who we need to be. So much of what we talk about when it comes to being a man and masculinity is wrapped up in these relationships and roles of being a husband and a father. But listen, God created man and defined these things in him before these roles existed. So masculinity is under attack, okay? And our response can't be to that attack. Because if you just respond to the, you know, chatter of toxic masculinity, Okay, if you just respond to that, you're already in a realm that is lost. That's why getting a clear picture right here, right now, where it comes from, how God made men and what he made them to be before their fathers, before their husbands, this is why it matters. And and listen, I'm starting to talk with some of you guys in the church because God's building something in us that says, hey, we, we gotta advance this in a, in a more intentional way. But I don't wanna fall into the pitfalls of the past, of just beca- becoming like another you know, guys club that just basically makes everybody feel good about their depravity and then go back home and do nothing different. If we're gonna advance these ideals, and we're gonna define what masculinity is because of what God designed in his perfect world so that we can get a picture of what we're starting. And now we start like growing up other guys in this. So much of this is understood before marriage. Now we can go to verse 18. Golly, here we go. Then God said, It's not good for the man to be alone. I'll make a helper who is just right for him. Okay, so here we got, we got, like, ask anybody, hey, what's man's original problem? 
And most people say, well, sin, it's original sin, right? That's the original problem. No, like God presents a problem situation right here. Man's original problem is aloneness. A perfect man lives in a perfect world and God's commentary on that is that this is not a good situation. A perfect man is in perfect unity with his creator. It's, it feels like heresy, I would call it heresy, except God said it. So it can't be heresy, because it's his words. Adam, you're in a perfect relationship with me, and this is not a good situation. Man's original problem is aloneness. God looks on the commentary, Genesis 1, 2, good, 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 not good. Hey, right here, this situation, not good. Not sinful, just not good. Adam and God are all perfect. God created marriage. Listen to this. This is the creation point. This is the beginning point. God created marriage to address the reality of aloneness. Some of you have yet to experience the fullness of what marriage is because you don't know what you're doing. You don't even know what the goal is because you don't even know why it was originally created. The very foundation of marriage is right here. This situation's not good. So God takes action. The context of marriage is God addressing a weakness or a problem of not goodness. Men, you'll never be a good husband without understanding that you have a problem and it's aloneness. I, I don't know how big this can get. I was introduced to this idea in 2010. I mean, I had like graduate degrees and undergraduate degrees, blah, 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 all that. And, and nobody taught me this. And it's not until I'm wrestling through like my own role as a husband and dad that I'm like, why? Like, and, and as you dig and dig, and somebody's like, hey, this is reality. I'm like, wow, like that changes everything. All of us in this room, every man in this room feels alone. It's, a, it's, it's how God made you. It's not even part of, it's not part of the sinful world that we live in. It's not part of your own sin nature. Some of you, your whole life could change today if you just embrace that truth. And you said, wow, like I need to have the vulnerability in my own life. Part of masculinity is the recognition that you're alone and that God says that's not good. Here's how this works. So um, put up on screen, aloneness, you got that, all right. See, we got two problems, aloneness and sin, all right? Aloneness comes first. And honestly, if you let aloneness run its course, it's gonna move you into sin. Part of the enemy's strategy is to get you alone. Isolation is always a part of evil. Because you live in isolation long enough, you're gonna move to sin. So then, God acts on our sin. He acts on the aloneness and he creates marriage. He acts on our sin and he literally sends his son, Jesus Christ, to solve our sin problem. But listen, so much of what like, we understand as church is that that's kinda where it is. Like that's, that's the end. You receive Jesus as your savior, you got your sin problem taken care of, good to go, man, heaven's next. And the reality is, is we got all kinds of people who have received Jesus Christ as their savior and they're painfully alone because the cross doesn't solve the aloneness problem. The aloneness problem existed in perfect world. The cross solves the sin problem and God originally creates marriage to solve this aloneness and then out of the cross, comes a new community of believers called the gathering, the ecclesia, the church, and God's mission, part of his mission for the church 
is to be a part of removing aloneness in this world. And so you got the cross to solve the sin problem, and now the church, your mission is the cross, but it also has to be the community that removes aloneness. One of our values here, adventure. We have seven values. We don't talk about them enough. But like the, the, the central value in the middle of these leadership values and these church community values is removing aloneness. Removing aloneness. See, here's, here's why this is so important. Go back, to, go back to this. There's a lot of people in our world, and you know this, they don't even know they have a sin problem. Like part of the hard thing about going out and telling people about Jesus is like, what do I need that for? You almost have to convince them that they have a sin problem so that then you can get to the cross. So if you've tried this, you understand what I'm talking about. But I'm telling you this, if that's your heartbeat, one of the things, one of the strategies you need to start employing is hey, before you start telling people about their sin problem, which generally doesn't go very well, start removing aloneness from them. Because let me tell you, they're alone. It's human nature. Even in a perfect world, Adam's alone. Your neighbor's alone. They just are. It's not a good situation. You can't convince somebody they have a sin problem, but everybody has felt the aloneness creep in and they know it's not a good situation. So let's make it our mission to like reach into aloneness. And as you do that, you watch how the Lord, as we, as we remove aloneness, you watch how the Lord opens the door to address a sin problem and be able to say, hey, here's the cross. This is exactly what you guys are gonna do this week. 108 kids with aloneness problems are walking in the door. And you understand that. Could you understand how important that is right when they drive up to feel like, oh, maybe this is a place where I'm not gonna be alone. Maybe this is a place where I can not be alone. Have some fun. And then you dig deeper. It's what student ministry, and like our, our students are alone bad place. It's tough. All right. How do you remove aloneness? Here's a quick verse. This is my mantra for this. Romans 12, 15. Hey, rejoice with those who rejoice. Find somebody that's worth celebrating and celebrate. Throw a party. Like, everybody needs to be celebrated. Everybody wants to be celebrated. They're not going to tell you they want to be celebrated. But if you're trying to figure out how to remove aloneness, rejoice with those who are rejoicing. And then weep with those who are weeping. There's sadness. There's sorrow. And you step into that boldly. That's what removing aloneness looks like. Removing aloneness just starts with serving people. I don't know anybody who's, who's like, hey, that person's a servant who's alone. There's always people to be served, always. So if you're alone, I'll just be honest with you, and you're on the mission of Christ, like it's part of that's just your fault. Because you, you refuse to celebrate those who are celebrating, weep with those who are weeping, serve somebody who needs to be served. And you're wait, waiting for people to serve you, weep with you, rejoice with you. Man's original problem is aloneness. God created him that way. And we've got to remove that, all right? Then God said, whew, this is not a good topic to, to deal with quickly, but here we go. It's not good for man to be alone. God's solution for the aloneness problem. I will make a helper who is just right for him. Guys, we're like way over, and I'm really sorry. Let's just, let's dive here, okay? That sounds weak. Agreed? Oh, man's got a problem, so let's make woman a helper. It's just a, it's not like, oh, all right. I'm a helper. So let's dig into the term. Listen real clearly. This term is used several times in the Old Testament. The only time it's used to refer to a person is right here. 
Every other instance in the New Testament or Old Testament where this specific word is mentioned, it refers to God himself. Don't miss that. It is not a weak term. If anything in the weakness in this story, it's the weakness of man who's alone, who needs a helper. And so God created the perfect helper. In fact, he says, who is just right for him. It's a, honestly, it's a powerful, powerful position to have the resources in you designed to meet a weakness of somebody else, right? Helper, Exodus 18, here we go. You might just wanna write, write these verses down. They're on, our, on your notes, so you can grab those on the app. Here's Moses, he, he's naming his kids. And this, his second son was named Eliezer, for Moses said, the God of my ancestors was my, just go ahead and say it, was my helper, God. So I'm gonna name my son after him because I've experienced a, a helper where I had a need and a weakness. And he rescued me from the sword of Pharaoh. Psalm 54, four, but God is my, one more time, God is my, the Lord keeps me alive. Does this sound like a weak position to you? Are you kidding me? Psalm 146.5, but joyful are those who have the God of Israel as their, whose hope is in the Lord their God. Fear not, for I'm with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and I will help you. I'll uphold you with my righteous right hand. Shift to the New Testament. Different word, because it's a different language. But let's talk about what does God describe as helper? Jesus' words, John 14, 16. I'll ask the Father, he's leaving his disciples, I'll ask the Father and he'll give you another helper. That he may be with you forever. It's the Spirit. 1 John chapter 2, 1, my dear children, I'm writing this to you so that you will not sin. And if anyone does sin, we have an advocate, a helper, who pleads our case before the Father. He is Jesus Christ, the one who's truly righteous. See, listen, God made Eve to be an everyday, moment by moment, powerful and tangible, helpful presence of God in Adam's life. That is a mouthful of a sentence. You ought to write it down. You ought to embrace it. You ought to read it. If you're a woman, married or not, this is your beginning point. Here's your mission. He made Eve to be present every day, moment by moment, powerful and tangible, helpful presence of God. Like, he describes her, he names her with a name that he uses for father, son, and spirit. I don't know you can get in better company than that. It's not just a reminder that Adam was not alone, okay? but a powerful, effective force of help in that aloneness. And so we get to this and we get to the creation of marriage, like it's God's compassionate solution, all right? Compassionate solution to man's original problem of aloneness, that's what marriage is. So like you have all kinds of people today defining what marriage is, and you define it in terms of relationship, I've heard a, lot of, a real popular one is marriage isn't designed to make you happy, it's designed to make you holy, which like there's some truth on that, okay? But it's not this, it's not original. This is, this is original because it's Genesis 2, it's a perfect world. 
The creation of marriage is God's compassionate solution to man's original problem of loneliness and his just right, perfect creation of a powerful, forceful presence of a woman in his life. So listen, if you say yes to marriage, you don't have to, but if you say yes to marriage, you are stepping into something that began right here and you ought to understand it really well. When I um, perform weddings, um, as I've grown in my understanding, I get to the point now where I'm like, hey, okay, you and you, let me talk to you two, right here. Husband, wife, wanna be husband, wanna be wife, here we go. When you say yes right here in this ceremony, you gotta understand that you're alone and you have an aloneness, okay? When you say yes right here, you are stepping into a role that only you can fill. You're stepping into a role of removing aloneness from your spouse. And when you go back to a perfect world, apparently God himself wasn't able to do that. Again, sounds like heresy, but God said it, so it's not. You are God's only ordained source of removing aloneness from your spouse's life. If you're married, you are God's only appropriate ordained source of removing aloneness from your spouse. If you're married, your spouse is your only appropriate means of getting your aloneness removed. The fair world that we live in starts right here where we say, hey, I feel this aloneness and now I'm gonna go outside of my marriage to, to, oh, that felt good, that conversation felt good, that compliment felt good, that hug felt good, that lunch felt good, that car ride felt good, that this felt good, that contact felt good, that night felt good and then we're off. Like, aloneness matters. And if you're married and you're trying, you're like, you're, you're, you're getting your, your fill of aloneness from somebody besides your spouse, you're, you're, you're in danger territory. Spouses, if you're withholding care if, if you get in this mode where you're like, Kali, can you just like grow up and not be alone so I don't have to meet your aloneness? Like, you, like you're, all, you're God's only ordained source to remove that from your spouse. If your spouse feels alone, honestly, it's your fault. It's your fault. You have to own that. Because apparently, according to Genesis 2, it's even hard. Like God, God says it's not good. If you have kids, dads, listen, you have, to, you have to be the aloneness remover from your kid's life, okay? Particularly dads, if you have girls, like you have to be that force of removing aloneness from them until the day where they get their, removal, uh, their aloneness removed from their husband. And vice versa, if, if you have boys, you got to teach them, like, listen, like, it's okay to be alone. You feel alone, that's natural, all right? Mom, dad, we're here to remove that from you and prepare you for a day when you'll be stepping into marriage and that'll be what God does for you through your spouse. This is the beginning of two becoming one. All right, Whew. sorry, that was long. You gotta get the heartbeat of God's heart for you in marriage. Listen, everybody in this room is married. We have fallen so far short of this standard. Don't let that be a defeat for you, okay? In Christ, 
He gives us power and strength to move back into the garden and be who, who God's called us originally to be and step into these places and show the world what, what marriage really is supposed to be. And when, when the world gets a picture of it, it'll be life-changing. Let's pray. God, uh, help us to be your people called by your name, intent on your word and your mission in this world. When I look at marriages, it just seems like unrecoverable as a society. So Lord, we repent. We turn from the wickedness of the world's view of marriage and we embrace and line ourselves up under you. Lord, with your power and your strength, I pray that you would move among men in this church and in this community to take up this responsibility of moral choice. I pray, Father, that it would impact every, every corner of our world. I pray that you would build men to take initiative. I pray, Father, that you would build them to be weak in their marriages and, and, and know the power of their wife. I pray that you would raise up women who know the power of being your name in this world and the resources that you've poured into them to be a force for you and your mission of removing aloneness in this world. I pray, Father, that you would make them aware of their power. And somehow, God, I pray that you would change the story of marriages here in Harrisburg. That you would begin a movement here and now that, that, that echoes way past any of us in this room. We love you, God, and we worship you, and we pray in Jesus' name.